All right. Today, family, we're going to, we have quite a bit of reading to do, but I think we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. Um, I didn't want to break it up just so we could see a little more of the body of what's taking place here. Um, and I was looking at, I, 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 I'm not the best with looking at people's posts and stuff like on Facebook and all of the, I'm just not the best with it. And then I'm terrible at responding. I'll see some things, but I, I was glancing through, and especially if it's a big block of reading, if it's a block of reading, you're going to probably miss me. You know what I mean? That's why I like if it's a video or something that I can listen to, it's, uh, it's more likely that I'll get to that more immediately. But if I got to read a big storybook, probably not going to happen. It's only, and that's only because I'm on the move most of the time. Right. So brother Justin had put up something about Jonah and I'm like, man, that's powerful. Like I knew that, but bringing that back to the forefront, it's powerful and it ties into so many things. So we're going to go to Jonah chapter one and we're going to read verses one through 15. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amatai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, the lightning of them. But Jonah was gone out into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. <laughs> so the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise up, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, every one to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation and whence comest thou? What is thy country and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I'm in Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven which hath made the sea and the dry land. A pause right there. He wasn't acting like he feared the Lord if he's running away from him. But I digress, right? Then, verse 10, then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, what shall we do unto thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was temptuous. And he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. And look at that. Jonah didn't even have it in himself to toss himself overboard. He said, y'all, you, you had to put this on your hands. He's getting everybody involved when he could have just easily thrown himself off if he really believed that the, the sea would be calm once he was thrown into it. But again, that's another trail. Verse 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land because they didn't want to throw this man over the board, overboard. But nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was temptuous against them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, had, has done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. There is so much that we could talk about right there, family. The main point of this is when you are running from your calling, when you are running from who God has called you to be, when you're running from, we can come up with all the, your divine appointments, when you're running from your identity in Christ, when we can use all of these terms, but when you're, when you're running from God, the people around you experience a storm. The people around you suffer. The people around you won't be at peace. And 
not necessarily because of them, but because the son of God didn't show up and do what the son of God does because you're running from God. Jonah was called to go into Nineveh. Nineveh was an enemy of Israel. Uh, when, when you hear about Nineveh, you don't get this out of the Bible, right? But you get it in, in extra uh, biblical texts uh, where they talk about how Nineveh was. Nineveh was a barbaric city. Uh, it's, it's been said that Nineveh would have the skins of their enemies stretched out in front of the city or on the walls or whatever. But there were skins stretched out like banners. It was a barbaric city. And these were the enemies of Israel. But God wanted Jonah, God in his great love, God in his great mercy, wanted Jonah to go into that wicked city and cry against it because their wickedness has come out before me. He wanted him, him to go into the city and cry against it. Jonah didn't want to do that because Jonah knew how good God was. He's not, you don't hear it here, but you'll hear it later on. It's Jonah's only four chapters. Read the whole thing. Jonah knew how good God was. I go in there. I start proclaiming this in the city. God, you're going to save them. No, they are our enemies. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going the complete opposite direction. And that's what he did. He had a, he had a, a, a knowledge of God. But what he wanted and desired was elevated above the, the wants and desires of God. That wickedness has come before me. Jonah, go in there. Cry unto the people. Cry against this city. Nope, won't do it because you're going to forgive them. You're too good. You're a good God. No, I'm going over here. And that's what he did. But when he did what he did, <laughs> I was like, all right, God sent the great uh, a great wind out to the sea. To, to tear, tearing the ship up. The ship was like to be broken. And look, notice, God didn't send the great wind out to the sea against the mariners who had other gods. You hear in the scripture that, that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. He didn't send this, the, the, the tempest out to the sea as a judgment against the mariners. They had all their other gods. They had all their other customs. He sent it out against his own. He said, no, come on, Jonah, no. But Jonah is like, I do not care. I will, I'm going down with this ship. He's down there fast asleep. You get an image of Jesus being asleep on the ship when the storms and the winds were raging. But this is a different situation. Right, so Jonah is chilling, relaxing, and everybody's out there panicking. They, they out there praying unto their gods, doing whatever they had to do unto their gods. They actually, it was so bad, they started to throw stuff off of the ship. Usually when they do that, it's because the ship's taking on water. And so to lighten the load, they throw stuff off the ship. So because Jonah wasn't standing up as a man of God and doing what, what God called him to do, they suffered a loss. Financially, they lost their goods. They were, whether it was food in it, what they, they lost. They suffered a loss. Their lives were in danger. But Jonah's like, nope. We all know somebody who has gone to gone astray, if you will. And it never works out for them. They can have a semblance of uh, happiness, if you will, for a time, for a season. Because it wasn't a me. The whole way to Tarshish, Joe, Jonah had an opportunity. Getting on the ship, Jonah had an opportunity. On the ship, Jonah had an eye. All this stuff didn't happen to Jonah immediately. He had an opportunity to change. No, nope, you know what? Uh, all right, I'm going to go back. Here I am at Tarshish. I'm count he's counting out the money. He had an opportunity. But in his mind, he's at peace for a moment, for a season. Because you know what? I'm not going to do that. Satisfying his flesh. I'm not going to do that. But then when he gets on the ship, 
the people around him, the people that are supposed to be blessed, the, the unbeliever, the darkness that's supposed to be lit up by the light, which is supposed to be blessed by the children of God, wind up going through it because of the man of God. Can we see this? Can we look back at a time in our life where I was supposed to be, and I know I wasn't, and because I wasn't, all hell broke loose around me. These people wouldn't even be in this situation if it wasn't for me. And we'll say, we'll look at the, we'll look at the, the quote unquote, we'll look at the wicked man. And we'll say, wow, they get chance after chance after chance. They can live as crazy as they want. They can do this, that, the other, and they can keep getting away with it. But if I did it first time, I'm done. Yeah, absolutely right. Victors whom to, to whom much is given, much is required. That's not just the that's not the Spider Man saying, guys. Well, uh, Uncle Ben or Aunt May said it to Peter Parker. It's not the Spider Man saying. You see it in the movie, to whom much is given, much is required. Who's been who 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 knows more of the ways of the Lord yet refuses to do them? He'll be beat with many stripes. But he who doesn't know the ways of the Lord doesn't do them. He'll be beat with fewer stripes. He don't know. So why would he get the same punishment as the one who knows? But yet still, there's a punishment handed out. <clears throat> and so Jonah, they, the lots fell on Jonah, cast a lot like drawing straws or whatever. Uh, the, it fell on Jonah. Then they're like, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, you know, look, guys, I, I serve God. I serve the Lord. I'm a Hebrew. And, you know, it's my fault. But if you want peace, cast me over. Come on. You, he's not even functioning as, as, as a prophet, as a man of God here, because he's like, look, if you want this to be done, you cast me over. I'm not even going to take respons accountability, responsibility for that. You got to cast me over. And then they're like, oh, no, nah, man, we ain't going to catch a body now. We're not going to kill you now. So then they start to row and, ah, come on, come on, row, row. Nothing. They fend for their life. But then with the enemy, uh, again, because though God said the tempest, the enemy was involved in that. Jonah was not acting and functioning as a son of God. So what the enemy would use for evil, God would use for good. Because in Jonah's selfishness, and this isn't the topic, and this isn't to say, well, see, if I can walk the way I want to walk, God can use my evil. And make, no, we're not talking about that. We're just pointing something out here. Because in Jonah's selfishness, and the men trying to do, you know, the right thing as far as life is concerned, it caused them to pray to the true and living God. Ah, oh, don't hold this towel chalk. Oh, don't let this innocent blood be on our hand, Lord. You do what you like. You're doing what you like anyway, but don't. It caused them to have a conversation with the true and living God. And then even after they threw him over and the sea stopped, the, the raging stopped, they're like, oh, they got a whole new perspective. They had a whole new perspective. But no thanks to Jonah. <laughs> But because of the mercy of God, the goodness of God that leads men unto repentance. And of course, we know the rest of the story of Jonah. Threw him in the water. God prepared a fish to swallow him up. Uh, right? But from there, again, we, we don't want to look at one thing. Because they say, like, out of, Scripture says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a matter be established. Right? And so we want to go to Genesis chapter 20, because in Genesis chapter 20, we see somewhat of the same type of situation. The details are different, but the heart is the same when the man of God refused to function as a man of God, chaos ensued. Hell fight, uh, uh, hell broke loose, if you will, for lack of better terms. All right, so let's follow along. Let's track along here. And Abraham journeyed from thence, starting in verse 1, toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh, Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said to his wife Sarah, she is my sister, said of his wife Sarah, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. 
But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech said, but Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she even herself said, he is my brother. And the integrity of my heart and the innocence, innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, look in a dream, God speaking to him in a dream. And God said unto him in a dream, yea, I know that thou did this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Look at that right there. We ain't even talking about sinning against Abraham or Sarah. You know what I mean? Because he would have taken Sarah and had uh, some type of adulterous relationship with her because Abraham did that. But he said, look, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. And I can guarantee you that Abimelech thought it was him or the situation wasn't right. He didn't think that the hand of God was moving there. God, be, God moves and a lot of times we just don't see it. We don't notice it until we look back and it's like, oh, pieces start to come together. Now therefore restore the man his wife for he is a prophet he shall pray for thee and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. As a very matter of fact, he wasn't pulling on punches. Know that you're going to die and everything, that, everything that's yours. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were so afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, what hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin that thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done? And Abimelech said unto Abraham, what sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, because I saw it. And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. She became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is thy kindness, which thou shalt show unto me. At every place where we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him, Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes. <laughs> I like how he, I like how uh, Abimelech's like, Behold, I give thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. <laughs> it's just, to me, it just seemed like a jab, but I don't know. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God. And God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because Sarah, Abraham's wife. We're going to pause there. So here's Abraham. Again, we're on the same vein. We're talking about a man of God not functioning as a man of God. Abraham functioning and operating out of fear, thinking that he, ah, I've got to put my hands in this in order for God to, I got to deceive the people in order for God to, like, even if it means this man takes my wife and has his way with her, like it's crazy. But Abraham looked with his natural eyes and thought, surely these are godless people that will kill me and Whatever, whatever. So you, my sister, it's not a good look. I'm pretty, <laughs> oh man, Abraham and Sarah probably were sleeping in different beds after that for a little bit, because Sarah probably was not happy. Like, this is the second time, Abraham? <laughs> but I don't know, it doesn't say that, but it, it just doesn't seem like it's one of those, it, it would be a nice conversation that happens after that, right? But 
Abraham lied. He deceived the he deceived the king, a, a, a second king for a second time. He deceived him, and look what happened. See, we read this, we read chapter twenty as if it's all within a day or two. I don't believe this is a day or two. I think quite a bit of time has passed. I think that Sarah was with Abimelech in his house for quite some time. Why? Because it was enough time for the people to recognize that all of their wombs had become barren. It was enough time for them to recognize that the Lord closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. We don't really see that initially when we read over. It's just like, oh yeah, well, she she took he took her for a night or two. He took her for a night or two, and Abraham got her back. No, nah. no, nah, he she spent some time there. She spent some time there. Yet and still, God kept her. Come on, Abraham, God kept her. But because of Abraham, this thing happened to the people. Because of Abraham's deception, again, Abimelech wasn't at fault. God saw that, like, you ain't at fault. That's why I'm coming to talk to you. You're a dead man if you keep, you, come on. Get that man back his wife. What you talking about? I didn't know it was his wife. That's his wife. He told me and she told me. That's his wife. Get him back. As a matter of fact, he gonna pray for y'all. He's gonna pray for y'all to be healed. Because through that deception, something was allowed to come on Abimelech. Again, see, these people are not, again, these people are not born again. Not even Abraham is born again, right? But he's a friend of God and he's walking with the Lord. But he's not born again. Abimelech's not born again. Abimelech had a conversation with God. We don't know the ins and outs of Abimelech's uh, faith, right? We know that God was establishing a people through Abraham. But as we saw before with Balaam, he knew God. Whether he was whether he was walking with them uprightly is one thing, but he knew God. Abimelech knew God. He knew, look, whoever's talking to me in this dream is not to be trifled with. He knew enough of God about, about that. But Abraham looked and saw, and these people don't know the God I know. They're gonna kill me and take my wife. No, sir. They can take her. That's <laughs> basically what he did. They can take her. But God in his mercy. God in his mercy. It wasn't because of Abraham's righteousness that he got sheep, oxen, men servants, women servants. It was because of the goodness of God, the mercy of God. That he blessed them, even though he was in the wrong. But the people around the man of God we're going through hell because the man of God was not standing up, being who God called him to be, walking up rightly before the Lord, trusting. He, had, he, knew, he knew God, but he had not been trusting him in this situation. Again, that speaks to us. I know God, but in this situation, I'm having a hard time. <clears throat> in this situation over here, the trust level, eh. But in a situation where we're not functioning, where we're not walking in the anointing, where we're not walking in our identity, we're not walking in our calling, when we're running from God in a situation for whatever reason, fear being mainly the big thing. Fear is what causes us a lot of times not to walk in faith. Fear of missing out, fear that God is going to do something or not do something. Fear that something's going to happen to us. Fear. Fear. Jonah ran away because he was afraid God was going to bless these people. He was right. But the people had to, to meet the standard. They Jonah went into the, the city, said in 40 days, this place is going to be destroyed. Da, 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 da. And the people repented. The people repented sackcloth and ash and God spared the city. He's like, ah, see, I knew it. 
He was afraid that God was going to bless his enemies. Abraham was afraid that his life would be in danger because his wife was a, she was a beauty. He was afraid. Matthew 5, 40, and we're about to wrap up, guys. I know we had a lot of reading. Matthew 5, 44 through 45. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them would despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. But we'll go back to verse 44, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Had that have been something that Jonah had locked in, he wouldn't have been on that boat. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Functioning like this, we're not functioning as men. We're functioning as children of God. That when you go into a place where there's fear, and, it's, you, and you feel the fear, sometimes you feel the fear. Like with the bear, I didn't feel the fear. But there have been plenty of situations where I felt the fear. Then with the bear. But there have been situations where I felt the fear. But what do you do when you feel the fear? Do you function and operate from the fear? It's a, it's a very big pull to function and operate from the fear. You feel it can almost taste it or smell it, like it's there. It feels very real. But what do you do with that experience of the fear? Do we trust that God is with me? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Again, this goes back to what we talked about earlier in the week. I trust God to the extent that I know him. To the extent that I know him, his character, his power, I trust him to that extent. If I don't, how can I trust somebody or something that I don't know? I, at that point, I'm rolling the dice. I might as well be casting lots. Well, we trust him. Isaiah 26.3, and I will give him perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Abraham didn't have perfect peace. He wasn't trusted in that situation. As a matter of fact, and that's, he didn't even receive the promise of getting Isaac yet. He didn't trust in the situation. And we're not pointing a finger because we've all been there. Some of us might be there right now in something, or at least it's in front of us, and we have to deal with it. But know that, again, as Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Sometimes we want to turn around and curse those who curse us. We want to turn around and not love our enemies. We want to speak all manner of evil against them. We're oracles of God. So I'm speaking evil against my brother. Effectively, I'm cursing them. I'm not speaking the best over them. Do good to them that hate you. But we want to repay evil for evil. And he says, don't repay evil for evil. Repay, repay evil for good. Isn't that what he did? It don't feel good. It doesn't make any natural sense. Why would I give my enemy a cup of water when he's thirsty? That is nuts. You're giving him a cup of water when he's thirsty because you know what he has or what he's doing against you has no, it, it, it can't prosper against you because I am with you. Now nah, I'm gonna let him starve out when I'm gonna let him die of thirst Get them off my back. Can't speak bad against me if your tongue is cleaving to your roof because you're so thirsty, roof of your mouth is so thirsty. Even in the Old Testament, he like when uh and about to close it. Even in the Old Testament, when uh Elisha, Elijah brought the army to the 
the enemy army to the camp of Israel, the uh, the leader of the army or the king, I forget which one, he's like, shall I smite them, father? Shall I smite them? He's like, yo, would you smite the captives uh, that you captured in war? Give them something to eat. Give them some drink. Uh, uh, give them some drink and send them back home. <laughs> All right. In the Old Testament. The, old, the same Old Testament where people don't like to acknowledge the goodness of God. They think it's only wrath and angry God. Same Old Testament. No, no, no. Get them in some water. Get them some food. And this is the same guy. <laughs> Elijah is the same guy that called fire down on his enemies. Notice that God didn't tell him to do that. But he functioned in such a way that, no, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down and smite the end, not 50. Boom. But then when the last guy came, he was like, look, look hey, my Lord, let, let my life and our life be precious in your sight. And then God's like, all right, man, go with him. Go with him. Stop being afraid. Go with him. So... I know I jumped around a lot there. There's a lot of reading, but now I want to open the floor for any questions, comments, concerns, disagreements, um, anything along those lines. All right. I think I saw Sharice uh, Hugs hands up first, and then we will go to you, Sister Tony. <laughs> 